What's up guys? Welcome to another episode of Redstone Engineering. This video is a continuation of the first basics video and will cover monostable circuits which are pulse limiters and memory elements which are basically indefinite pulse extenders. With that, let's start with memory elements. Up first is the SR latch. Here I have three of many different ways you can make an SR latch, all with their own advantages. The way an SR latch works is it has one input that will turn the memory cell on and one input that will turn the memory cell off. And the thing with an SR latch over say a T flip flop is the fact that you can do one of the inputs in a row many times and nothing will change. All that matters is when the inputs flip it'll turn the memory cell either off or on. Likewise with this design you have one input that will turn it on and one input that will turn it off. And again you'll have one input that will turn it on and one input that will turn it off. The reason I like these three designs specifically is because I feel like they each have a unique advantage that's very useful in certain situations. This design right here is extremely cheap and it's also extremely flexible. As long as both torches are connected in a loop like this and you have access to both inputs, you can do whatever you would like with it. This design right here is very vertically compact, it's only one block tall, meaning you can stack a lot of circuits all right next to each other in a very compact space. Likewise, this design right here is only one block wide, so if you need something like a combination lock where you need to have a bunch of stuff right next to each other, it's extremely useful in that situation. Next up is the T flip-flop, which is the correct technical term. Why it's called a flip-flop, I don't know, maybe because the circuit diagram kind of looks like a pair of flip-flops. It could also be because the electrical signal switches sides every time the output changes, but I like the first reason better. So it works by toggling the output either on or off every time the input turns on. So right now it's off, we hit the button, it turns on, and then we hit the button again and it turns off. It works by taking a monostable circuit, which we'll get to here in a minute, and it gives a one tick pulse length into the sticky piston, which will then just leave the block here. This design only works in Java Edition because Bedrock piston mechanics are a lot different. So if you're using Bedrock Edition, you'll have to use the next design. So this design works by literally pushing an item around in a circle. We have a dropper that faces upwards into another dropper that faces into a hopper that faces down into a dropper that faces into this dropper. So it literally makes a circle. The way it works is it takes an item that goes in here first, and when you press the button, it pushes the item all the way around into this dropper, which is then read by the comparator and turns on the lamp. And then you press the button again, it pushes the item from this dropper to this dropper, and the cycle continues. This relies really heavily on powering opaque blocks, so I would recommend watching the powering video if you haven't already seen it. Whichever design of T flip flop you use is ultimately up to you and the requirements of your circuit. This T flip flop works a lot faster, but it's also a lot longer, whereas this one works slower, but it's a lot shorter, and it also works in Bedrock Edition. Now, if you're going for style points, this T flip flop design is for you. While the boat is up, the lamp is off because the pressure plates are not getting pressed down. When you hit the dispenser, the water goes away, and then the boat falls back down and enables the lamp. When you hit the button again, water comes back out, and after some dramatic pausing, the boat will come back up and the lamp will turn back off. Next up is the D flip-flop. You don't see these very often because they're highly situational, but they do come in handy from time to time. A D flip-flop basically works by storing whatever the data signal is when an update signal comes in, or otherwise known as the clock signal. So right now it's off, and if we update it, nothing happens because this signal is off, so it basically pushes in the off signal. When we turn this on, nothing happens until we update it, and then it pushes in the on signal. And you can turn this off, and it, nothing will happen until you update it. This design specifically relies heavily on quasi-connectivity, which if you're unfamiliar with that, then again, I highly recommend the powering video. If we're using Bedrock Edition, we need to use the next design because Bedrock Edition doesn't have quasi-connectivity. This design is slightly more spacious than the other ones, but it does work in Bedrock Edition. Basically, there's just an SR latch here that takes this data input and pushes the redstone block in one direction or another when the update signal comes in. So right now the data signal is on and nothing happens until we hit the update and when we update it, it pushes the redstone block here and it turns on the lamp. We can update it as many times as we want and it'll just push in the same value until this changes and this pushes in the off position. The last memory element that I quickly wanna go over is one that can store specific signal strengths. You can actually build it by just having two compare mode comparators. However, having one in subtract mode and having a signal to it allows you to both reset it and also subtract signal strength from the stored value. 
So we can store a signal strength of 15. We can store a signal strength of 1. And you can store everything in between. And like I just said, you can store a signal strength and then use subtract mode to then subtract a bunch of signal strengths. So we can subtract a signal strength of 14. And you usually need like a one tick pulse sort of setup, like a monostable circuit, which we'll get to in a second, in order for it to not just subtract it indefinitely until it turns off. But this is very useful if you're trying to do something like hexadecimal encoding or something like an order sensitive combination lock. All right, now let's talk about monostable circuits. Monostable circuits are circuits that only have one stable output, and in this case, they're all off. These specific monostable circuits are designed to reduce the length of a pulse down to usually one tick, but they actually can be adjustable in the case of these horizontal ones here. This is a rising edge monostable circuit, so it happens when the button goes from off to on, as we can see here. And we can see that the lamp isn't on for the full duration of the button, it's only on for the first tick. This falling edge one activates when the button goes from on to off, as we can see there. This is a rising edge, this is a falling edge, and these are adjustable because you can adjust when the piston goes and the lamp will be on for a little bit longer. And if you need more time, you can just extend the repeaters out this direction. This one's also adjustable in the same way, and you can see that it goes for a little bit longer. These two designs don't work in bedrock condition because the piston mechanics are a little bit different, but these two designs do work in bedrock condition. All right, guys, that'll be it for this episode. I hope you learned something of value, and if you have a favorite design for any of the circuits we talked about, feel free to leave them in the comments since I would love to learn about them. As always, I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time.